Hey, I got to get right to it, ladies. We have got a hot topic today, and it's so hot. We're talking about hell. And how are we talking about hell? The topic title of this show is called Hell's Best Kept Secret. And who do I have with me but my bucket list person, Mr. Ray Comfort. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Ray. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. You know, I tell you, this is a hard guy to get. And so let me tell you a little bit about him. I have really admired him and been so thankful to him uh, from afar. Uh, But let me tell you a little bit about Ray Comfort. He has a YouTube channel, friends, with 189 million viewers. I know it's hard. It's hard to believe there's that many people, but there is 189 million people on YouTube. It's called livingwater.com, livingwater.com. You guys look it up on our website at himforher.org. We'll have a link there, their logo that you can click on, which will take you immediately uh, to that site. So you can watch his shows that he has on there. Um, he's got 189 million views. He co-hosted with Kirk Cameron, the award-winning Way of the Master. Yes, Kirk Cameron, remember that actor? He came on and he was doing evangelism with Ray Comfort as well, airing in over how many countries? 200 countries, friends. Uh, he's also the producer of a number of award-winning movies that have been seen by millions. Yes, he is my bucket list guest. And we're going to talk about Hell's Best Kept Secret. And if Hell has a secret... Wouldn't y'all want to hear about it? Um, This is a wonderful evangelism method that I have used, you guys, in prisons around Africa with death row inmates in the United States prisons, in jails, in the streets of Tel Aviv, Israel, with Jews for Jesus. In churches, I've used this at dinner parties, at restaurants, at doctor's appointments. When we what we talk about today, you can use absolutely anywhere. So, Mr. Ray Comfort. What would you say is hell's best kept secret? Fill us I in. knew you were going to start with that. It's a one hour teaching and I've got to squeeze it down to two minutes. Well, let me see what I can, <laughs> let me see what I can do. Firstly, may I correct you? It's living waters, plural, not living water. Oh, living waters. Isn't that funny? Yeah. I got it written right. I just didn't say it right. Livingwaters.com. Thank you. So, mm-hmm. so the, the drips are plural. Um, <laughs> hell's best kept secret really is based on the principle. Well, let's go to a doctor. If a doctor's got a patient in front of him, who knows he has a serious disease, it's a terminal disease, but he has a cure in his pocket, he's not going to talk about the cure first because the patient doesn't realize he's diseased, that he's in great trouble. So what he does is he points out the symptoms of the disease before he brings out the cure. And when he talks about the symptoms of the disease, the patient begins to sweat. The doctor says, good, he's seeing how serious this is. And then when the person says, what should I do? Out comes the cure, and now that patient is going to appreciate it and appropriate it because he understood he had the disease before he was given the cure. Exactly the same applies with evangelism. If we run around saying, Jesus will help you, Jesus will forgive you, Jesus will give you peace, what we're doing is bringing out the cure when the person doesn't understand they have the disease. And what we must do is do what Jesus did. And in Mark 10, verse 17, the rich young ruler came running to Jesus, knelt down and said, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus didn't give him the gospel. He didn't talk about a wonderful plan, God's love, good news. What did he do? He reproved his understanding of the word good by saying, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. And then he gave him five of the 10 commandments. So why did he do that? To show him what good is. Bible says most every man will proclaim his own goodness. You ask anyone, do you think you're a good person? I'll say, yeah, I'm a really good person. Why? Because they don't understand that good in God's book means moral perfection in thought and thought, word, and in deed. And only God is morally perfect. So how do you show someone they're not perfect? Well, you bring out the commandments as Jesus did. You say, how many lies do you think you've told in your life? Let's see if you are a good person. They say, I've told I've told a stack of lies. <laughs> And so many. What do you call someone who tells lies? A liar. So if you ever stolen something, say, oh, yeah, just little things. What do you call someone who steals? Well, a thief. So what are you? I'm a thief. So no, you're not. You're a lying thief. Do you still think you're a good person? <laughs> so what the law does, the, the moral law, is it brings the knowledge of sin. And this is what happened to David when he committed adultery. He wasn't concerned. So when Nathan came to him to reprove him, He didn't talk about a wonderful plan. He didn't talk about good news of God's mercy or God's love. He told him a story of a man stealing another man's lamb. And then 
he said, when David got upset with that man, he says, you're the man. Why have you despised the command of the Lord? He was doing the same thing. He was making sin personal. And that's what Paul did in Romans chapter two, when he said, you who say you shall not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You say you shall not bear false witness, do you bear false witness? And so what the law does is it confirms the truth of the gospel and it confirms sin in our own heart because the conscience bears witness. So that basically is hell's best kept secret. There's a lot more um, in the teaching, but that's kind of a synopsis. You know, it's just so powerful because <clears throat> what you're using is, is not that cotton candy approach, but what you're using is God's word uh, to convict people. I love the parachute analogy. Could you share with our friends a little bit about that? Oh, boy. You know, I've shared Hell's Best Kept Secret 837 times, and I haven't done now. it for years, but <laughs> let me give it a try. Okay. Uh, if you're sitting in a plane and someone comes up to you and says, hey, I want you to put this parachute on, it's going to really improve your flight. You're going to say, well, it doesn't make sense. I'm quite happy as I am enjoying the flight, but I'll give it a try. So you put it on, and things are going fine until the flight gets bumpy. And you say, well, this is awful. I've got stuff spilling on me. It's a bumpy flight. This didn't improve the flight. You take it off and throw it down. Instead of being told the parachute improves the flight, we should be telling passengers they're going to have to jump out of the plane. Not that it improves the flight. You put a parachute on to be saved from a 10,000 foot jump. So if you put it on for that motive, when the flight gets bumpy, you're not going to take the parachute off. You're not going to get upset. You're going to cling tighter to it, even though the flight gets bumpier and bumpier because you're looking forward to the jump. And so when we say to people, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll improve your life. He'll help your marriage, drug problem, alcohol problem. He'll make things better. Things go better with Jesus. That doesn't happen. The Bible says we, through end of the, we enter the kingdom of God through much tribulation. The apostle Paul had an abundant life. It was full of beating, stoning, shipwrecks, imprisonment, martyrdom. I didn't know what problems were until I became a Christian. I had a, began a really bumpy flight because I lived godly in Christ Jesus and suffered persecution and tribulation and temptation like I never known. And so if you put on the Lord Jesus Christ to improve your flight for things to get better, you, you're going to be disillusioned and become what we erroneously call a bitter backslider. Instead, we should be telling sinners, you're going to have to jump. You're going to have to pass through death and face a holy God. And for that, you need a savior. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ to escape the wrath that's to come. And when tribulation strikes, when temptation comes, when all sorts of trials come, that'll drive you closer to the savior, not further from him. Lion's dens for a genuine convert drop us to our knees, not making us, uh, making us shake our fist at God. So that's the difference between genuine and false conversion. That's the difference between a biblical gospel presentation and the modern erroneous gospel presentation, which is creating false converts and filling our churches with false converts also. You know, Hell's Best Kept Secrets has really helped a lot of churches <clears throat> excuse me, as well, because they get right to the heart of it. You know, like I had said, there's a lot of cotton candy preaching. Uh, you know, there's the good news where it's only good news. They don't talk about what God's word, the whole of God's word is. And what would you say, you know, you talk about converts in the church. What would you say is a present, present percentage of backsliders of converts? Well, the statistics show that up to 80 or even 90% of those making decisions for Christ through older calls and through the modern methods that are used, like music and the raising of the hand and the leading in a sinner's prayer, they create 80 to 90 backsliders, what we call backsliders, with every 100 decisions for Christ. And if I go fishing and nine out of 10 fish get out of my net, I need to look at my net closely because it's got big holes in it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did back in 19. 82, I began to look closely at evangelism and say, why have we got so many people falling away from the faith and all these bitter, anger, angry backsliders? And I found, as I had mentioned earlier, that Jesus used the principle of opening up the divine law, the Ten Commandments, which he did on the Sermon on the Mount, to bring the knowledge of sin. And I saw where the Apostle Paul said, I had not known sin, but by the law. He said, by the law is the knowledge of sin. He said, the commandment, which I thought was ordained to life, brought death to me and that's the function of God's law to shut us up under the law to condemn us to show us our terrible state so we'll cry out like the uh, like the uh, Philippian jailer who came under that earthquake 
uh, what must I do to be saved? It gives the, it shakes the sinner to know that he's under God's wrath and has violated his law. And so that's why it's so important to follow biblical principles and not use our own modern man-made methods. If somebody wants to get more information on this, where can they find it? Well, if, they get, if you go to the bottom of livingwaters.com, you'll find, uh, you can listen to Hell's Best Kept Secret freely and another teaching called True and False Conversion. Totally free, livingwaters.com. Just go to the bottom of the homepage and click on it and it'll talk to you. You know, I really enjoy your YouTube channel. I love watching you out in the street. And, you know, you have mentioned in the past that you love hecklers on the street. Why is that? Oh, you know, I've been open air preaching uh, for 30 or 40 years and I've got used to hecklers and I love hecklers. A heckler is, some, is someone who objects. My big fear and most people's fear when it comes to open air preaching is having a heckler. My big he fear is not having one. <laughs> a heckler will take a crowd from 10 people to 100 people in 30, 40 seconds. If he starts yelling at me and saying, you silly little twit, your dumb accent, I hate what you're saying, people pack around. And that's what Jesus had when he open air preached so often. He had massive crowds and people asking him questions. And when we read scripture, we forget that these people were hateful and passionate about what they said. So there would have been emotion in what they asked Jesus. And no doubt it pulled in plenty of uh, hearers. But even more importantly, it brought out wonderful truths that Jesus gave us in scripture because of hecklers. So when I get a heckler, say, what are you doing here? I'm, I say something like I'm telling people how I can find everlasting life. Do you know how to find everlasting life? They say, no, I'm not afraid of dying. Say, of course you are. Everyone's afraid of dying. You know, and, and so it's a, it starts a wonderful discourse that grabs people's attention so that other people can hear the gospel. And that's why we live as Christians to proclaim the gospel. You know, you've had a front row seat to watch people cross over from death to life, basically. I mean, how exciting. Is there one that really stands out to you as one of your favorites? Oh, yes. A guy named Mario was very uh, casual beginning. I was riding. I've got an electric bike and I have my dog on the bike. Like, hang on. A I'm going to leave this for two seconds. Forgive me. This is worth it. <laughs> have an appetite. Now, you guys find us on YouTube so you can watch this. That's my dog. He's so cute. Look at those goggles. Are those goggles or sunglasses? Uh, so is the dog cute also. Um, <laughs> thank you. Though. Absolutely. Yeah, they're sunglasses. He wears sunglasses. So I wear sunglasses. And so I can drive up to any crowd and just say, hey, how you doing? They immediately say, whoa, I like a dog. How do you keep the sunglasses on? Has he got a dog? So I ask people how they can, uh, what they think if there's an afterlife. And I get to talk to them and get them on camera. But this day, I was riding my bike with Sam on the front. The guy looks over. I stop and say, how you doing? He says, good. I said, would you like to be on YouTube? He says, sure. I said, you don't know what it's about. He says, oh, I still like to be on. And his name was Mario. And uh, Mario was very confident, very handsome young man, probably about 20, 22. Very confident with new age beliefs. And uh, as I took him through the law, I got a shock in my life because tears started dripping out of his eyes onto his cheeks and he became very contrite. And I said, do you want to get right with God? And he says, yes, I do. And very moving. I think that's had 2.3 million views. Mm -hmm. Nothing fancy, no bells and whistles. Uh, when it comes to the video, it's just straight him talking into the camera, but it was so moving for me. It actually freaked me out because uh, when you can see come, someone come under conviction, the fear of the Lord fills my heart because this is someone getting right with God, finding everlasting life, and I really don't want to mess up. I really want to keep my hands out of it, and uh, it worked out great, and it's a very popular video. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's, uh, it's up there with our popular videos. Well, we could Google it and easily find it. Um, no problem as well. And we'll make sure that we put that as a link on the bottom of our uh, YouTube show as well. So they can just click on it and watch the interview with Mario. Um, what are some of the biggest uh, hurdles that you've come across in trying to share outside on the street? Oh, my own fears. That's my biggest hurdle. Um, I share the gospel with literally thousands of people, all sorts, atheists, angry people. But every time I see... A Zacchaeus, they immediately turn into a Goliath. It just doesn't fail. I look and say, oh, I'm going to share the gospel with that person. They're going to hate me for it. I'm scared. I'm nervous. And what I've learned to do is not listen to my fears. Courage isn't the absence of fear. It is the conquering of it. So it doesn't get easier. It gets easier in a way that you're able to control your fears like a firefighter. When he arrives at a fire, 
He looks up, he sees on a fifth story is a woman and her two children standing at a, at a window screaming as flames leap out and, and uh, lick their clothes. He has to climb a 60 foot ladder. Is he terrified? Absolutely. Would he rather be somewhere else? Maybe with his wife and kids watching an old black and white movie on TV? Absolutely. But he ignores his fears because he's not listening to himself. He's not listening to his own fears. He's thinking about that dear woman, her two children and their terrible fate. And that's what we're doing to do as Christians. In fact, the Bible likens us to firefighters. In the book of uh, Jude, others save with fear, pulling them from the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So what we've got to do is ignore our fears and think of the fate of the ungodly. If they die in their sins and death is fearful, this side, wait to the other side with a lake of fire. How utterly horrific. And that's why the apostle Paul said, wherefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. If you don't know the terror of the Lord, you've got an image of God that's like a celestial Santa Claus or a cuddly teddy bear, then you won't know the terror of the Lord. And you won't bother to persuade men. You won't seek and save that which is lost. You'll just carry on praising Jesus, lifting your hands to him, but not reaching out your hands for him, which is empty hypocrisy. Jesus warned those that do such, you're, not, you're like those who draw near to me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. So let's make sure our heart is close to the Lord's heart, that we feel his heartbeat. We know what, Je Je Jesus, what drove Jesus to the cross. It was a concern for the lost and what's their fate. And we should have that same love and concern for the ungodly. Amen. You know, there's a really good illustration used as well on uh, living waters. Uh, and that is the um, fireman analogy of the firefighter who came to the scene of the crime. Um, can you add a little bit uh, more to that for our listeners? Because it really is a powerful story. Yeah, you're making me pull on my memory. I know, back. I'm pulling oh, out your old ones. <laughs> that was like 20 years ago. Kirk Cameron shared that. I wrote Sorry, it. Sorry, I've it. been following you a long time, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was a firefighter who chose to sit and listen to a CD on the earphones while people burned to death in front of him. And uh, we used that analogy. What do you think would be the fate of that firefighter? Should he go to jail? And everybody agrees. Absolutely. That's just disgusting that he'd be listening to uh, music while people are dying. And then we bring it back to the, to the responsibility of the Christian not to be filling his heart with entertainment and other things. If you're a Christian, you will reach out to the lost because the love of God dwells within you. That's why we seek and save that which is lost. Love is a sign that you've passed from death to life. And so if you're not concerned for the ungodly, you really need to do what the Bible says and examine yourself and see if you're in the faith. And if you're not, get to your knees and say, oh God, forgive me for having a cold heart. Help me to overcome my fears and be true and faithful to what you've told me to do. Amen. Amen. And, you know, I've thought about that analogy often as we're always busy in life and we're running from here to there. And, you know, it seems like these God appointments pop up when you least expect it or at the least convenient time. And I think about that fireman analogy where he sat in his fire truck while other people died. Um, and because he was listening, he was tuning in, you know, a new radio he had bought for the chief. But um, you guys, it's just so vitally important, everything that Ray is talking about. Do we love people enough to stop what we're doing and to share uh, the good news of Jesus Christ using God's word, which I think is so powerful. And that's why I love Hell's Best, best Kept Secret so much, because, um, you know, you don't have to be a scholar or a scriptural you know, expert as much as you just have to know the love of Christ and his word and his Ten Commandments and how he uses it. How did you first come across this, Ray? Well, I was very frustrated. I began an itinerant ministry early in the 1980s, and I began finding church statistics saying that most people were falling away from the faith, and I thought, this is crazy. And then one Friday afternoon, I was sitting in my office as a, an associate pastor, and I read the words of Charles Spurgeon, part of a sermon when he said something like this, what will you do when the law comes in terror? When the trumpet of the archangel shall tear you from your grave? When the eyes of God shall burn their way into your guilty soul? When the book shall be opened and all your sin and shame shall be punished? Can you stand against an angry law in that day? And I went, whoa, that's a little different from God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. So I tucked it in my memory banks. And that weekend, uh, about 100 miles away, I had to prepare for a church uh, sermon. And I had my Bible open, and I was open at Galatians 3.24, and I read this. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, 
And I didn't read it as that. I subconsciously read it as this. Wherefore, the law was Israel's schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. And I thought, it doesn't say that. It says our. And I thought, I wonder if Spurgeon was doing something biblically sound. He was using that moral law to drive sinners to the cross. So I closed up the Bible and, and I went and sat in a, in a heated pool. It was a thermal pool uh, in, this, in this town I was in. And, uh, and I said, I'm going to use that principle. The next person that sits next, sits next to me. And this gentleman is a big guy sat next to me. And instead of telling him that God loved him and, I, and, and the God-shaped vacuum and all that stuff, I, I went through the, some of the commandments. And I says, it's because I had to face God on judgment day. And I realized I was committing adultery in my heart by lusting according to Jesus. And that's why I needed a savior. I needed to repent and trust in him. And I'll never forget it. That big guy stood up steaming because it was really cold. And he says, I've never heard that put so clearly in all my life. And he mm. just walked off. And I thought, I've never had that happen before. And so I began studying Spurgeon, Wesley, Moody, Whitfield, Luther, all the greats that God used. And they all said the same thing. If you do not use the law to bring the knowledge of sin, you will fill the church with false converts. And so I began preaching it and teaching it, formulated hell's best kept secret, thought of myself i'm going to be alienated as a legalist and the exact opposite happened doors flung open and thirty thousand pastors watched a video that i made on the subject just through and david wilkerson called from new york and and said he appreciated the teaching kurt cameron listened to it twice called and says i want to combine ministries and uh so that began our television program that's in its seventh season went to 190 countries and i look back and go wow you know god open up doors and it's just been a wonderful ride oh yeah Kirk Cameron called and uh from there um he was frustrated for another 12 months and said how can we get this teaching to the church and then uh we presented it to a large television network um they shared Kirk actually teaching hell's best kept secret with my bible notes and uh I think our website got over a million hits the next day it collapsed it crashed and then they said, please come back and create a television, produce a television program with these principles. And we did. And the rest is history. It's just absolutely marvelous. When I saw that show, I was one of the million who listened. And that's how long ago it was. Um, but I tell you, God's done a powerful work. And it, you guys, if you're afraid of sharing the gospel, or if you're afraid of sharing with other people, it's super easy with this method. Please go to livingwaters.com with an S on the end, livingwaters.com. Make sure you go there. Their website is full of information, books, tracks, flyers, things you can hand out, tips, techniques. Uh, there's also a, a school, if I remember correctly. Is that right, Ray? Yeah, it's got over 20,000 students. There's an online school called the School of Biblical Evangelism, which brings Amazing. out these principles. Amazing. Okay, so hang on, friends, because um, Mr. Ray Comfort has been kind enough to stay with us for a second show. And we're going to be talking about uh, his new book that is um, already out, and there's one on death we're going to be talking about as well. So I'm really encouraging you all to come back and listen, how to be free from the fear of death, and why would anyone follow Jesus? 12 reasons to trust what the Bible says. You know I love you, over and out.